Yes, good boy. And this is Jenny. Mwah. Good girl. She's very good. She also Just gendered the dog. My bad. That's fine. Everybody assumes golden retrievers are boys. We found it doesn't help that they both have NASA collars that are blue. So everybody, my husband thinks that everybody assumes they're boys because they have blue collars. I usually say B O I, which is like a gender yes, neutral I, ish form, but when I point. say it, yeah, yeah, when I say it, it's not that obvious. So I always have to clarify that, and it becomes weirder. Mm -hmm. I switched to saying good dog when I don't know a dog. You're right. That's what we should do it. Usually, if I say it's a dog, it's a, actually a dog. Uh, yep. Yeah. We're learning diversity and inclusion from dogs now. Yeah. We're already starting all, off really well. Not all dogs are good boys. Some are good girls. Oh. <laughs> yeah, Ginny's over there crunching away at her carrot, so got to keep. Got to keep this one away while Ginny eats her carrot. Otherwise, this one will bully Ginny out of her carrot. Yeah, while we see the dogs, we'll try to give a few minutes for people to join WebEx. Okay. All right, carrot has been eaten. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Oh, my God. All right. Shireen, do you think we should go now or give like two more minutes? Um, I'd say we can probably start now. Yeah, I guess we can just start with the introduction of the organizations and everything. Well, if anyone is trying to join now and we did choose a very busy day because it's Thursday when all the homeworks are due for students and a lot of students are preparing to go home. So. I believe a lot of students will benefit from the recording as well. Oh, there's another person. Yeah, so we could get started now. Shereen, could you yeah, share the screen? Yeah, I'll share my screen. Does everyone see the screen now? All right, let's get started. Thank you so much, everyone who's here for joining our panel. I know it's been a busy day, just like I said before. So this is so meaningful for us that you are here today. We are going to be talking about diversity and inclusion in the space industry with four amazing panelists that are here. So before we get started, I just want to make sure that everyone is aware of, oh, we did not fix that link name. Whoops, I will send the right link name to the chat right now. It's actually tiny.cc slash MRF questions for any attendees who want to ask personal or any type of questions they have to the panelists as the panel goes. Please submit your question through this Google form. Now it's in. Next slide, please. So we would like to start with introducing some of the organizations that contributed to this panel. So Jack is a representative from Purdue Space Program, and he will be talking about the Midwest Rocketry Forum and the PSP. 
Yeah, thanks, Judy. So I'm Jack. Uh, I use he, him pronouns, and uh, I am representing a Purdue Space Program and our Midwest Rock Tree Forum Initiative. PSP is the Association of Rocket Teams and Satellite Design Teams on our campus. We do a bunch of other stuff too, uh, but we have five technical teams right now with rockets uh, and satellite teams represented. I personally am part of our Liquid Rocketry team, um, and I'm also the uh, committee chair for our um, uh, Midwest Rock Tree Forum initiative. So you can go to the next slide, please. Uh, so the Midwest Rock Tree Forum is our uh, attempt at a virtual conference this fall. Uh, our theme is Footprints Revisiting the Past and Set Towards the Future. And we were really, really lucky to collaborate with Wea and uh, Judy uh, on bringing together this panel. Uh, so in addition to doing uh, workshops like this, next slide. Um, so MRF is, uh, has podcast series releasing every Saturday with guests all from all across the industry, lots of different stories. Uh, you can access our podcast on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and our website. Um, the name of the podcast is the Purdue Space Podcast. Uh, we have a bunch of other workshops, uh, also including this one, to be posted on the PSP YouTube channel. So you can go back and listen to some other uh, good topics from uh, you know past alumni uh, and other stuff like that. Uh, and if you are interested and in, uh, want to get more updates on future MRF events, register at the link there. And that's all for me. Thank you, Jack. Next slide, please. Yeah, so the second organization we would like to introduce is Women of Aeronautics and Astronautics, which is the national chapter of Purdue VIA. And I am also part of this organization as the chair of Com conference events working group. It is my honor to serve as a moderator of this panel. My name is Judy Park. I'm a junior at Purdue University. And as I said, I'm the chair of conference events working group and the technical development subcommittee. So for WOA, WOA is an international organization dedicated to increasing the participation of marginalized genders in the field of aeronautics and astronautics. And we are aligned with the main professional society in the field, AIAA, and we have created a network of university and professional chapters. WOA is a centerpiece that combines central AIAA leadership with the K-12 pipeline and established industry veterans to create a community for marginalized genders. We aim to accomplish together increasing women's and any other gender minorities' involvement in technical and professional development in the aerospace industry. So, yep, that's about it for WOA. And I am also part of the Purdue chapter of WOA, which is named Women in Aerospace. Uh, similar purpose as the national chapter, we aim to empower women and marginalized gender by providing all undergraduate students with inclusive educational, outreach, professional, and social opportunities in the aerospace engineering major at Purdue. We host events like FYE Socials, Pan FYE's first year engineering, by the way, and panels and events with industry. And we also have an annual Amelia Earhart Summit that is going to be happening in March. So stay tuned for this amazing summit we're planning. Next slide, please. So now we would like to introduce our amazing, amazing panelists. So we would like to start with Katya. Katya, if you could introduce yourself a bit, we would appreciate it. Sure. So my name is Katya and I also go by Kat. I am an electrical engineer at NASA's Air Propulsion Lab. I am also actually a transfer student. I went to San Diego City College and then I transferred to UCLA. I got my internship at JPL while I was still a junior in college. Um, and it was really lucky for me because JPL is really close to UCLA. So I was able to continue my internship working part time. So essentially, after my first internship with JPL, I just never left. <laughs> I continued working for time. And then I was offered a full time position about six months before my graduation. So I never had to interview either since they already knew me. Everyone in the group already knew of my work and who I was. Um, so I basically just showed up again for my first day. Uh, and it was a really normal thing. I worked on the Europa Clipper mission, which is an awesome orbiter going to Jupiter's moon Europa, which we just had amazing news about it, that Europa might actually glow in the dark. 
So we're really, really excited about that. And um, we're essentially waiting for Europa Clipper to be able to tell us whether that is in fact true. Um, I am part of the hardware team and currently I am the only woman on the team. So talks like these are really important to me. Thank you, Katia. Next slide, please. Bobby, could you introduce yourself now? Yeah, sure. Hi, um, I'm Bobby. I'm a graduate student at Georgia Tech. I'm studying, I'm doing my MS in aerospace engineering. Before that, I was at Cornell doing my bachelor's in mechanical engineering with minors in uh, aerospace and business. I am an international student from Mumbai, India. So uh, just navigating the whole women, you know, in aerospace engineering journey has been especially hard given that, um, given the added pressures of being international and not having citizenship and the roadblock it creates um, with, um, you know, research and internships. Um, in the past, I've done research with JPL, I've interned at Planet. So I've been in these aerospace environments and have felt um, the lack of women in these spaces. Uh, so, you know, like Kat said, it's very important to keep having these conversations. So you know, women who come after us in similar positions have, have someone to look up to. Thank you, Bobby. I really want to mention that you are an inspiration to me because I'm also an international student trying to navigate through the undergraduate program and all the accomplishments and experience you have gathered is just incredible. And I always look up to you. You're Thank somebody you. I, yep. <laughs> Next slide. Hi, Alicia, could you introduce yourself now? Yeah, sure. Um, so I'm Alicia. I'm also an international student. I'm from the UK. Um, so I'm in my second year of my PhD at UCLA and I'm doing geophysics and space physics. So before coming to the US, I actually studied astrophysics for my bachelor's at Edinburgh in Scotland. Um, but then I decided I want to go for planetary science. So I'm doing more research um, to do with like lunar surface processes and also like orbit dynamics of low altitude satellites. So like modeling all, and all that stuff. Um, but yeah, basically I've been trying to push for a lot more diversity and inclusion in the kind of academic academia world in my department and trying to get department leadership involved because currently it's like pretty dire, but yeah, we're trying to make it like a better place so that people feel more welcome to come to the department basically, yeah. Thank you, Alicia. I, I'm really excited now. I haven't had like 50% of the panelists being international. So this is super exciting for me to see. Um, Kate, could you introduce yourself? She's my graduate TA in my research. So I'm really excited to have her here. Yeah, no, I'm excited to be here. I was really excited when you uh, asked me to join. Um, I am Kate. I am a PhD student in aeronautical and astronautical engineering at Purdue University. Um, I research small satellite propulsion uh, in a few different ways. Um, I got my bachelor's and my master's degrees at Purdue as well. Um, the main uh, technology I've researched is a micro thruster and nozzle that my uh, my grad mentor, uh, Tony, and uh, my uh, advisor, Professor Alina Alexenko, developed and patented uh, back in 2013. Uh, that's the main thing I've worked on is a water based thruster for uh, attitude control and small satellites. Um, I'm also working on some drag sail uh, research and modeling for uh, atmospheric reentry uh, for small satellites after they've uh, completed their missions. Um, I also am a co op at NASA Goddard Space Flight Center. Um, I work on a few different missions there, uh, Petit Sat being one of them. Um, which are also small set, mostly small set uh, missions. And I do uh, star tracker work there, um, which has been really interesting. And I love everything about making uh, science happen. I had a few internships with Northrop Grumman when I was an undergrad, and I learned very quickly that while the military end of aerospace is interesting, it's not where my interest lies. I got to work on James Webb Space Telescope at Northrop, and I realized that what 
makes me really excited to go to work every day is getting to work on the science missions. So that's what I've been trying to do ever since. Thank you for all the cool introductions. Um, so that is the end of the slide at this moment. Just for the new people who have joined just before, I just want to reiterate that I shared the, oh, I might have to share it again because new people might not see this. So I'm sharing the link to submit the questions. Any questions you have for the panelists throughout the panel, please submit through this Google form and we will uh, try to get all of them answered. So now we would like to get started with the actual panel. I prepared one question here. Why do you think focusing on DEI and diversity, equity, and inclusion, we call it DEI here. So I will be using this um, acronym a lot. So hope you don't get confused by that. Why do you think focusing on DEI and aerospace is important? What should employers look at as motivation other than just filling a quota? Anyone who feel comfortable ask, answering could go first. To speak about this. Um, so there are two big reasons that come to my mind. One of them is that it has been proven through uh, research that women actually perform better in the workplace when there are more women around. Um, and this is something that I personally have also experienced. For example, the best person at work that I have ever worked with is a fellow woman. We got it done. We were so comfortable with each other. There wasn't that awkwardness that there sometimes is with um, a lot of the male engineers when it's the first time that they're working with me. And, and a lot of them are kind of like, oh, I don't know how to talk to you. I don't know how to treat you. So when there are more women, everyone is, is able to learn how to work with each other um, much better. So that's something that I've come to realize with the particular group that I'm in. Um, there hasn't been a woman in a very long time. So as soon as a woman comes in, it's kind of like weird, right? They don't know, they don't really know how to interact with you. It's uncomfortable for you as a, you know, as a person who was joining a new group, it's uncomfortable for them. So that's something that when more women join these industries and these groups, you know, those interactions are not going to be awkward anymore. Um, and, you know, secondly, it's, it's, very well known that currently in the tech industry, our, we have way more jobs than we have people to fill them. Um, and we have an entire, you know, half of the population that is completely being discouraged out of these careers. So when we have more women taking up these careers and entering these fields, it is also going to benefit these companies in the long run to have more of, of the people, um, you know, entering these fields and getting educated in STEM. Yeah, I fully agree with you. Um, so with my internships at Northrop Grumman and with my position at uh, Goddard, just sticking on the industry side, I only had fellow co coworkers that were female when I worked on military projects. So I, main one I worked on was F-35. That was the only project I worked on. It was probably about half women where I even had a female coworker at. Um, so at Northrop with the James Webb Space Telescope, there was one woman who was the head of the experiments for the hardware testing. Um, she was the head person. She was like my boss's boss, basically. Never got to interact with her other than passing her during an equipment test. Um, Otherwise, it was all old guys. Like, there wasn't even somebody who was remotely close to me in age. Um, they all were older than my parents. So that was really strange. And I definitely felt the, I am both the youngest person here and also the only female in, like, this half of the building, um, which was a, a different experience. So even at Purdue, there's a lot of times where I would, like, look around the classroom and be like, ah, there are two other girls in this class. Um, and that still is kind of an ostracizing feeling, but at work, you're walking around and I didn't see another woman the whole day. Um, at NASA, I'm the only girl in my branch, um, which they have had a couple of interns ro rotate through while I haven't been there that have been girls, but none of the full-time employees are female. 
there's other women in the other branches that we work with that I see on a regular basis, but it's, that's one of the things that I always think of is like, what's wrong? Why don't you have more women? Um, and I've never had an issue with my coworkers, like not wanting to work with me or feeling like it's uncomfortable to work with me. But to me, it's just a weird feeling of being the only person in a 30 person meeting who is female. Uh, now speaking on that, NASA is the most uh, diverse, like as far as like ethnic groups go, definitely diverse. They, there's everybody under the sun working for NASA and they are very good at hitting those kind of uh, percentages. It's just my branch seems to be the only one that's all male. Um, but stepping back into academia, my research professor is one of the only, it's only five, I think, female professors at Purdue in aerospace. And I gotta say, it's been wonderful having a female advisor. My friends who have male advisors, I, I think there's not quite the connection that I have with my advisor. She, I, I definitely feel the sense that she connects with me better. She talks to me about the like women and inclusiveness. She opens up about those topics with me. And I know she doesn't open up about that with some of the male students that we have in our group. Um, so that's a connection that I have with her. I would like it if there were more female professors, I would like that to be more common. Um, but even within my research group, there's only one other woman um, student. So it is definitely something where you feel a little bit underrepresented. Yeah, I, I completely echo that feeling. I So I came from a mechanical engineering bachelor, so mechanical still had, we were like 7% women, so I still didn't feel um, feel alone and because very early on freshman year I found my group of you know three women and we all did classes together and homeworks together so I never had to look beyond and see that everyone else is just all guys um, but then coming to Georgia Tech it, it was the feeling of being you know it's me and this other girl in class and then I was in classes where I was the only one with, with you know 35 40 other you know other guys um, and never had a female professor through my bachelor's and my grad school now that I think about it. Uh, um, but uh, taking it more to what can the industry do, what I noticed in my most recent internship was the way they did their feedbacks was they had 75% or 80% professional feedback every quarter where they would be like, you know, these were my goals, I achieved them. Uh, but then 20% was personal goals, um, but more, focused on volunteering, diversity, uh, and you set some goals for yourself, say, I want to volunteer, you know, 50 hours this quarter, and then you talk to your manager. So you don't really, it doesn't affect your promotion, but it's just an accountability professionally. And what I noticed, even despite that, like, it's, it's a great initiative. I haven't seen, you know, many traditional companies um, do that. Uh, so I was very, I was very proud of that. But then the more I spoke to employees, the more I found out was the only people upholding diversity in their personal uh, goals were the were the people who fell in those diversity groups. So it was the women who were like, this quarter I want to promote, you know, X Y Z women's initiatives at this company, and it was the people, uh, you know, of minority, uh, racial minorities who were upholding their goals. But it wasn't the people who who weren't in those groups didn't really follow those as their personal goals. And I feel like that's where you fall short because the whole idea of it's the minority cannot hold the burden of the minority as well. It's uh, yeah. So if, if, if there's some way to make those, if, if they're, if they have these personal goals as a requirement, you might as well make them per section. So if you want them to volunteer, if them, if you want them to focus on DNI, um, yeah, that's my thoughts. <laughs> no, I definitely resonate with that. I think um like as someone who's gone between fields quite a lot, like I've taken classes in geology, engineering, astrophysics, like it seems that there's like trends depending on the field. So like engineering is definitely the worst for gender diversity. Um but then looking at geology, I'm now in a geology department. It's actually almost 50 50 
but the ethnic diversity is terrible. It's like 95% white, um, even though I'm in LA, which is like a super ethnically diverse place, like it doesn't reflect the average population. But I think that what the point you were making about um, the giving credit for like EDI work or DEI work, that's like a really big thing that we're trying to push for in like the division wide, like UCLA wide thing, because often this kind of invisible labor really does fall on the on the minorities. And it's kind of also expected of you. Like, of course, you'd want to make it like a more welcoming environment for people like you, but then you don't have any allies who are backing you up and who are also doing this work. So it all falls on the minorities to do this work. And then they're doubly disadvantaged because they have all this extra stuff that they want to do in DEI, but then they also have to do their research, you know, like, and do their job. Like, so yeah, definitely I've been trying to push for like, like a course credit or something for grad students at UCLA. I mean, this is like long-term, but I hopefully it will happen in the future, but it's and something where they could like actually like do a concrete thing that would like help minorities like and also improve diversity at UCLA because it would make people who are applying to UCLA like realize okay they're valuing DEI in this institution or company like therefore like I want to be a part of this environment yeah one interesting thing on that is for the research project that uh, Judy's part of um I helped my professor start that uh, back in 2017, and we started off with four students. Um, and one of the big things that uh, my advisor wanted to do, she was like, I'd really like it out of those four students, and at least one of them was a girl. I said, okay, we'll see who applies. I had six students apply, one of them was a girl. Um, and so she was gonna get picked either way because she had one of the better resumes out of the whole group, but I was really happy. But then we went through several semesters after she had applied where we had no girls applying. And I this was before um, the Women in Aerospace program at Purdue had gotten started. And I was trying to reach out to girls. I was trying to have her even reach out to her friends and be like, hey, we'd really like it. Like, so it wasn't just you and six other guys. Like, we, we want this to be a more equal footing for this research project. And she said, I've tried to talk to my friends into it, but they don't want to work on the project because it seems like it's going any most research projects like that seem to be like a boys club type thing where the guys are just using it as another way to hang out. And I was like, wow, that is an, an insight that I didn't know about. Um, so on top of the uh, the whole outreach that it falls on the minorities typically, um, you also then have these cultures where maybe the minorities don't feel like they're necessarily geared for them, which seems insane. It's a research project. It's a class. <laughs> um, but that was something that we took to heart and we tried to further make the course seem like a course. Um, and then we did get more uh, women to apply. It It took us actually making it less of a on your own time project and turning it into something a lot more official for us to have more women apply to the project. Um, we still have a discrepancy in those numbers, even for our department, but we're working on it. And I, I would hope that having a female grad student and a female professor running the class would have made it already seem more inclusive, but it still didn't. Um, so that was just an observation similar to uh, where you fall and where what spaces you belong in um, is definitely a visibility thing. So that's that's one way in which, again, the majority needs to take some of the burden. Um, if we want to see the numbers change, you have to kind of force a hand in a way to make it happen. Thank you for all the amazing insights. I actually just realized that we were talking about two different um, facts about aerospace engineering in general. That one is that we all agreed that this major especially lacks diversity than many other STEM majors do. And another is that aerospace major seems like 
a relatively a niche major compared to other STEM major as well. And I just wanted to bring up the correlation between those. And I wanted to ask if any of you have um, any comments or ideas about how to overcome those um, nicheness of the major, but also the lack of diversity in the major. I mean, I can kind of comment, like I'm not an aerospace major, but I feel like having projects and opportunities that are more interdisciplinary is like something that's really important. So my first like exposure to engineering was actually during my undergrad degree. I was part of this Hyperloop team and it was only engineering students. And I just heard about it because it, they went to SpaceX and I was really interested in space. So I, was, I started like I joined the team because it sounded like a really cool thing to do, but I learned like a lot. I learned like a lot of engineering, like knowledge and everything. And I feel like, honestly, like I then kind of like got more to the leadership of the team. And I realized that a lot of the, like, we only had a few female students in the team and almost all of them were not engineering students. They were physicists um, mainly. So I think it was quite interesting how like opening it up to like other disciplines, like brought in more diversity because it, it also like kind of maybe would make it less intimidating almost like, like it's, it's more like, okay, it's more open. Like you can have like transferable skills. Like if a physicist can do this, then I can definitely do this. You know, like someone who had no engineering experience like me can do it. Therefore, like anyone can do it, you know? So I think like it, interdisciplinary projects like that are something that's like really, really like a good way to like improve like diversity and like inclusion like very quickly something like that yeah thank you for I, this amazing insight oh I, sorry i interrupted i agree um completely with the project idea um we've been trying to make um stuff interdisciplinary forever but especially at purdue stuff's just stove piped and that's an issue at a lot of places in a lot of schools, the departments are structured so that they can't overlap like that. Um, so there's a bit of a bureaucratic, um, at least at a university, there's a bit of a bureaucratic hoop you have to jump over. Um, but then honestly, I think there's only so much that can be done necessarily at the university level, unless you want to at Purdue specifically the first year engineering program, everybody just gets into that and then you pick from after your first year, basically. Um, I'm really sorry if you can hear my dogs, they're playing. Um, <laughs> but the, uh, so unless you wanted to target the women in the first year programs, like if we're looking at Purdue and try and get them to come to the program um, that way, a lot of the students that I knew that were going into uh, aerospace engineering either really loved planes or were super stoked about stuff to do with rockets. Like, and most of them were guys. Um, I I got into it because I, I thought I really like like NASA and all of the missions and stuff. I want to learn how to make that happen. Whereas most of the guys were like, I want to learn about how a rocket works. Or I really want to know more about the F twenty two, and like. That is two different routes of getting to the same major. Um, and it's, there's something you, you would have to do, I think, and I'm not trying to give the universities a break. They don't do enough, but there's definitely something to be said that fostering a love of space and showing that it is a space for girls as well is very important. I just wanted to agree with um, everything Alicia and Kate said as somebody who is also majoring in mathematics and as well as aerospace engineering and somebody who didn't really know that aerospace engineering existed until my high school senior year. I don't have a lot of space trivia, which a lot of students coming into aerospace engineering bring. And this is honestly another barrier that um, stops people from different disciplines or even women and marginalized genders in general that um, didn't have enough exposure to the astronautical engineering slash science material. 
it, I believe it is also like a huge privilege that I did not have until I came to Purdue University. So I'm trying to take advantage of it as much as possible, but it is still very difficult to catch up with uh, all the years of knowledge that other people who had access to those since childhood have. So maybe I'm not, I'm not sure how exactly people could uh, improve this, but maybe just bringing down the, I don't know, the wall of space trivia and all those knowledges that are required to join the projects or clubs or everything could really help bring more people and more women and marginalized genders into airspace. Yeah, um, thank you for the insights. Now we're going to move on to another question. There were two questions that basically um, have the same question which is, what advice would you give to a woman and gender minority in a male-dominated group if feelings of discomfort or imposter syndrome starts to take a toll on work ethic? And the second question was basically um, how there are men in projects that don't expect women to be able to um, use machine shop equipment, equipment and everything that only men are expected to do well how to um, address these mindsets of those who believe women cannot do typical male tasks without coming off as bossy or rude. So yeah, basically asking how to um, communicate with the men in aerospace engineering who are not very familiar with the concept of diversity and inclusion and have prejudices towards women and gender minority. Yeah, I can speak on this. I have unfortunately uh, experience. <laughs> um, so when I first started working in industry, it was um, very difficult for me because I mean, yeah, I still had those experiences in uh, when I was at UCLA, you know, where like guys didn't want to study with me. Guys would automatically assume that I wasn't smart enough. Um, and all of that stuff, which I'm sure has happened to most, if not all of you. Um, but when you get to industry, it's a little bit different because you, especially when you are an intern, it is extremely scary to stand up for yourself because you are scared that they will just get rid of you. If you say something, if you, um, for example, tell your boss about something somebody said, or if you stand up to that person, um, you're scared that maybe they'll go off and figure out a way to just get rid of you, maybe not bring you back as an intern, etc. Um, so this is something that I really had to work on how to navigate that situation of, um, you know, not just letting those things happen and to keep letting those people that were saying these things to me feel like they can get away with it. Um, and I recently heard a really interesting story where my friend was telling us that when she was in school, she had a professor who would say really inappropriate things to her in front of other male students. Um, and she sort of just sucked it up, let it go, finished the class, tried to forget about it. Um, and then an advisor came to her and said, hey, I know you had this professor. Did you have any negative experiences with him? Because we've had some complaints. And so that's when she finally said, you know, yes, this is what happened to me. It happened multiple times. He said this and this, and there were other people around. He said it to me in private. He said it to me in front of other women. He said it to me in front of other guys. And then the advisor said, why didn't you say anything? So then my friend said, well, you know, I didn't want to get in trouble. He's in charge of my grade. I didn't want to like fail the class. I finished it. I'm done. And then the advisor said to her, you know, you might think that you're done, but that was, if you think about it, a very selfish thing for you to do because you're done, you already finished, but this professor who is doing these things, he gained power. He now knows he can do whatever he wants to these female students, say whatever he wants, and he's going to keep getting away with it. And not only that, but he is showing the male students around him that you can talk to a woman like this nothing is going to happen to you 
And every single time that it keeps happening and they, they keep hearing this, it just keeps reinforcing that. And the next woman that comes after you could get it worse. So once I heard that, and I remembered all of those times where I did the same thing, where I didn't say anything, I was scared. Um, you know, I, I really had to put that into perspective of it's not just me, it's the people that come after me after he already got away with this. Um, so it really has been a situation that I've, I've had to learn how to manage, continue to learn how to manage. But I have found that even as an intern, when I stood up for myself and I said things like, um, you know, I really don't appreciate you talking to me that way or comments like that are extremely inappropriate. And unfortunately, our boss is going to have to hear about this. They stop dead in their tracks like they really do. I have never seen a man so afraid then when you you don't even have to raise your voice. You don't have to do anything of that. You just look them dead in the eye and you tell them I do not appreciate you speaking to me that way. And it, I mean, at least for me, it has absolutely worked. It takes it takes a while for you to get, you know, the courage to to say these things. If you have to practice it in front of a mirror, go ahead, because I've had to do that before. I, you know, I may look confident now, but I was so, so introverted, so shy, so quiet. Um, and unfortunately, as women in these industries, we have to be strong and we have to practice our tone. We have to practice speaking up and standing up for ourselves, because the longer that we continue to not stand up for ourselves, you know, these things are going to keep happening and they're going to keep happening to other people, perhaps worse and to you as well, because. You know, whoever said that to you is now aware that you're not going to do anything about it. So. Do something about it. That was so good. Sorry, that just really resonated. <laughs> so inspiring, honestly, like. I've like had that question before and I also have asked that question of other like women in the industry and some people have said like pick your battles you know like don't always call them out because I mean it's hard isn't it when there's like a power dynamic and you're not sure what the repercussions would be but the way that Kat said it just like that makes so much sense like if you don't say it now it could happen to someone else even worse. Um, and I think like that's made me like rethink that whole attitude towards it because I used to say to myself, just pick your battles, you know. Um, but yeah, no, I think that's a really nice way of of thinking about it. Um, but I also wanted to talk about the imposter syndrome thing that was mentioned because honestly, like in my first year of my PhD, that was a huge and it still is like a huge like obstacle for me personally, like coming into like a completely different field from my undergrad was just a huge adjustment. And I felt like I didn't know what I was doing and everyone else knew what they were doing. But then I had this conversation with my supervisor and he was telling me how this is someone who's like, he's very experienced in the field and everything. And I look up to him and he was saying, oh, I'm gonna be giving a talk um, next week. I'm really nervous. Like I always worry that people won't know what I'm talking about. and will think that I don't know what I'm doing. And I was like, wow, okay. So he's feeling imposter syndrome as well. So if he's feeling it, that means everyone feels it. Everyone feels imposter syndrome. So it made me feel like so much better about like not having faith in my abilities. And like, I definitely feel that it can sometimes even like affect your work. Like this thing called stereotype threat where you subconsciously think that you're gonna do worse in like a test or exam just because you don't fit like the white male like stereotype of like a physicist or an engineer and honestly like that's happened to me before in exams where I've just kind of overthought everything and kind of psyched myself out of it but like remembering that like everyone feels imposter syndrome to some degree is like really helpful for like pulling yourself out of that spiral I find and also remembering that you are yourself are empowered like it's all about feeling empowered in yourself um to like you have control over how good you're going to do. It's got nothing to do with what anyone else thinks of you. Like it's all in your hands, basically. Yeah. 
I wanted to elaborate on it because both of you did an excellent job. Um, and I have a good story to tie the two together a bit. Um, so with the imposter syndrome, I have definitely felt that. And I don't think I have any good recommendation on how to make it go away other than first find your tribe of people who will like talk you up to yourself. Um, having people who tell you that you're good at what you do and externally reminding you is a good thing. Um, I was lucky enough to find um, some really good friends within my major who were also women who also were experiencing the imposter syndrome who would remind me that I was not correct in how I was thinking about myself, um, which helped immensely, especially getting through my master's. Um, but when I transitioned from um, undergrad to working on my master's, I that summer I had to give my first conference presentation and I was in the middle of one of my internships. They only gave me 24 hours, like a whole day off because it's an internship. You don't really have days off. And I had to go to Canada um, to give this in-person presentation talk. So I get I get there. I'm trying to get ready. It's, I'm the first person up for, for the whole session for that day. I wasn't able to watch any of the sessions from the day before because none of it was on online. I've never been to a conference before. I've never given a conference presentation. Um, and I had gone through it with my advisor and she said I was ready and was, I felt kind of okay. And so I, I did it and she showed up that day and I didn't know she was going to be there. And she watched me present. And then afterwards she talked with me and she told me that she thought I did a wonderful job and she could tell I was nervous. And she told me, so she's Russian. Um, and so her, she has an accent. Sometimes people don't understand what she's saying. Um, because of the accent and it makes her super self-conscious. And she told me this afterward and she's like, I hate giving any kind of presentation. It like, even for classes, I have to give myself a half hour, like to prepare for lecture because I'm really scared. Someone's not going to know what I'm saying. Um, Cause she's, her English is perfect. It's, there's not an issue. She just has a thick accent. So she is very worried all the time um, about public speaking and her telling me that and me and her saying that she's worried about people not thinking that her work is as good as it is because she can't present it well. Um, and knowing that she also feels imposter syndrome made me feel a little bit better, especially about giving presentations. Um, but I still was feeling it going into my master's. So that first semester that I did my master's, I learned how to do um, hand machining, like hand mill, hand lathe. Um, I learned all of the circuitry that I, I did for my project, I worked so hard to try and like live up to this expectation I had of what grad students had to be doing and what research meant. Um, and also so I could prove myself to some of the other grad students that I was working with at the time that like I'm willing to put in all of the time and effort. And I have since learned that that is really unhealthy behavior. Um, so it it was partially a trial and error for me figuring out how to live up to my fellow male grad students who were very good at machining, who were very good at electronics, who like could remember stuff off the top of their head because they'd been doing it for longer than me. And I felt like I needed to live up to some expectation that was false um, to prove that I was as good as the guys. Um, so it, it took a bit of self-reflection and burning out really hard after my first semester to realize that none of that was true um, and that you don't need to work yourself to death in order to live up to what you think is correct. Um, you have to find a balance. So I don't know if that's necessarily concrete advice for anybody, but it took a, me a lot of trial and error and I would hope it doesn't take that kind of trial and error for everybody else. No, I I completely agree. I guess so. While while all three of you were speaking, the one thing that kept resonating was the one advantage that we have as women is thanks to the patriarchy, we've been conditioned a little to think more from a caring perspective, and women are pushed more to find that balance and to focus on self care and and you know in grad school and then in the industry, 
I think we carry that with us. So it's it's women who usually journal about their experiences or try to find that tribe. And at the end of the day, it's going to be it's going to be helpful to have that just for your, you, you know, it's pushed as a personal growth, but it helps a lot with your professional growth because you learn how to communicate and you learn how to, you know, separate your your emotions from how you're doing your work. Um, yeah, that's. Yeah, so I'm not giving concrete advice, but I'm just saying be proud. You know, it's not it's not just all um, roses and yoga. It, it definitely helps. Um, and to answer the you know how to deal with deal with men in traditional men's um, activities like machining and stuff, it's uh, because I started off in mechanical. I had a lot of like traditional mechanical engineering stuff to do, so working on cars and learning machining, and and I dealt with a lot of um, boys who did not want want women there in their spaces. And one thing that always worked was very innocently asking them what you could, what, why they don't trust you in this position, or what what at the question I went with was what can I do better, because. When you ask that, usually they don't have concrete advice for you because they haven't thought about why they don't like you being there. They just don't like it. Uh, so you, if you ask that and if they can't come up with anything, it, it's a very innocuous way of making them realize this internalized, um, whether it's misogyny or I mean, most probably <laughs> uh, recognize this without without explicitly saying, hey, this is um, this is not inclusive behavior because then they're going to get all defensive about it. Uh, so, yeah, just just trying to ask what you could be doing better or what it is that you're doing wrong or um, why they don't think you should, you know, if it's a group project, usually I would never get assigned the machining task, even though I was fairly good at it. And so just asking why they don't think you could do it if they come up with something. Um, luckily, we're all, you know, in young and in learning positions, so you could just say. I would like to have this opportunity to learn more or do better myself. And then they, they're not going to fight you because you're still in school or you're still an intern. Um, but yeah, that's that's my advice for that. Uh, it still it still requires to put yourself in a vulnerable position, but at least you're doing that to your advantage, to your professional advantage. So all in all, win win. <laughs> This is like so therapeutic to me. I'm I'm a mere moderator out here, but oh my god, it, it feels like I just gained like four engineering moms who are like telling me that it's okay, you know, just giving me virtual pets. And <laughs> this is totally unprofessional, but man, that's how I just feel right now. Um, moving on to the next question. So I just want to ask uh, all of you that I know that you guys are like experts at actually getting the DNI implementation done. I want to ask how um, all of us can, whether it be allies or um, the marginalized genders or women in ge like in general, how what kind of things can we do to implement diversity in aerospace? What have you done personally? And what do you think other allies can do? What do you think other women and marginalized genders in aerospace could do. I know many of you here are amazing SciComm people and like, you know, I, I, I've seen, I've stalked your Instagram and everything. <laughs> uh, yeah, so please share your experiences and your thoughts. The biggest one for me so far has always been opening those doors. So when I was in, when I was uh, during my school, like my undergrad, uh, every time I led a team uh, and I was in a position of recruiting members for the team, I would always keep an eye out for for women or for other minorities. And it's it it would always stand out a little because their resumes were written a little differently. Their application questions were more the you know the responses were more modest. And then I had to justify to the rest of the team why I still want this candidate or why they should at least be allowed an interview. Because being in that position myself, I know that I answer interview questions or application questions uh, by muting down everything because I don't want to sound like I'm boasting or bragging about my experience or making things up, even though you know I hadn't accomplished enough or or something. It's it's a thing 
you know, it's, there's a lot of research on it. That's how women approach um, recruitment or conversations. And so if you are in a position of power like that, then open those doors for other women so they can at least, especially in university, they can, so it, it, it always begins with an experience. So yeah, for me, it was make sure that you're recruiting more women if you can. And for allies, it's a very similar, it's a very similar advice but to recognize, to put some effort into recognizing how women approach these situations and try to keep that, be cognizant of that when you are talking to or recruiting a woman. Uh, because, uh, yeah, yeah, because I feel like I haven't had that experience in my personal recruiting experiences, where it's like, if you're talking to a male recruiter, they're expecting a certain kind of bros, bros, like conversation about engineering and rockets. And like, I'm excited about the same things too, but it's just, I don't talk about it the same way as you, or it doesn't show up, um, similarly. So not to use that as a negative. And try to try to take the extra step and recognize how to communicate with women or how to recruit women and how to recognize the potential in women. And I guess in closing, one one big thing that always stood out to me was recruiting for men is based on potential. So what you can what you see in them or what you see how what they could be. But for women, it's always performance and accomplishments. So what have they achieved so far? And try to recognize that that gap and and make it potential for women too because because you know we're all young and we we can all do great things but it's usually that you've not been given the opportunity from the very beginning so how can you have those accomplishments that was super that's so interesting i didn't even know about all this recruiting like way of thinking about it but i can speak about what i've been trying to do in my department, um, I think a lot of it comes down to accountability. Um, so like over the summer with a lot of the like protests with George Floyd, there's been a lot of performative DEI statements and emails sent around by departments saying, oh, we're going to do better. Like we know it's like, we're bad at ethnic diversity right now, but we'll do better. But then like nothing's actually happened. Um, so kind of holding people accountable to what they say they'll do and like actually having some concrete actions. So with like a lot of these things, there's often a lot of bureaucratic like red tape involved to actually make like these long term changes. So finding like small things that will have a big impact and something that is within like this person's power to do. So whether it's the department head or your supervisor, just something that's within their power that would immediately make a change. So for example, we've been trying to get the um, GRE GRE test um, removed from the requirements for, for graduate students applying to our department because that is shown to immediately increase the diversity of your applicants. And that's like fully within the department's purview to decide whether or not they want the GRE test. Um, so that's like one thing, like just finding something that something is that that's a concrete action because often you'll you can say okay we want to improve the climate of the department but there's no like specific way to do that like if you don't tell them okay do it in this way like these steps like i found that like having clear concrete like goals is like something that really helps like change actually happen in these cases because often people will just talk about the problems and then nothing actually gets solved in the end. But yeah, like concrete actions is something that I really have been trying to emphasize a lot. So I can speak about um, some of the things that I've done so far. So when I first um, got hired full time, there was another female intern also in our group. And, you know, I was a little bit more outspoken, a little bit more confident about how I went about it. And so I received my offer, um, but she's a little bit more shy. She kind of like what, what uh, Bobby was talking about, more modest about her accomplishments, more modest about her potential. And so my boss, he had an extended a full time offer to her. Um, even though we'd been around for about the same time. And so what I started doing was 
every time that I would have conversations with him, I would bring it up to him. And um, so I got kind of annoying because it, it was to the point where I would be like, hey, so when's Tara getting an offer? When is Tara supposed to get an offer? You know, she's going to get snatched up by somebody else. She's amazing. I already heard that Google is trying to interview her. So I don't know what you're waiting for. Um, and so, yeah, it got to the point where he uh, called her in and had that conversation with her. She received her offer. Um, and then I had already gone through the process, right? So speaking to the HR person, all of the uh, like salary negotiations. So I was very open with her as well, uh, letting her know, hey, this is how much I got. If they try to offer you any less, do not accept it. Make sure that you are this at the minimum. Um, if they try to say anything, like, don't let them because that is exactly how much I got. And I already found out and our fellow male coworker who also got hired. That's exactly how much he got. So we gotta be, a, uh, we gotta be equal here and let them know. So I kind of took on that role of being her advocate because I noticed that she was a little bit more on the shy side. Um, and then also being sort of like her cheerleader slash, uh, coach because, you know, sometimes you have to just be aware that not everybody is that confident yet so some people um it depends on their experiences or just the type of person that they are and it is not fair that if you are a shy person you're gonna get screwed over out of a job or out of a decent salary so that does not sound right to me at all um, so that's some of the things that i've done and then also with my different platforms um, when I started working and I was the only woman and I remember we had a meeting where my boss was talking about how we had three women total in our group of about 55 engineers, um, a couple of whom are already gone. And I remember him saying, you know, three out of 50. Yeah, that's fine. That's not, it's not that bad. You know, we don't have zero. So. I started just having those conversations regularly with all of my coworkers about how it's not okay. Those numbers are not okay. Um, every time that he would ask for advice of what the group can do better or what we can be doing better as a whole, I would always bring it up. Um, you know, every time that there's recruitment going on, letting everybody in charge of the recruitment process um, that they have to keep an eye out. And also me, you know, when I was recruiting for an intern, um, unfortunately, I, I wasn't able to choose, um, a woman, but out of the resumes that I saw from the female engineers, kind of like what Bobby was talking about, they're just too modest. Um, they weren't letting, you know, that these are the amazing things that they did. So I would reach out to them and say, Hey, you know, this resume could be better. Here's some tips. These are some things that you could speak about. Um, I need to know about the complexity levels for this project. You're not really telling me how much of this you did. If you say, you know, I have designed a board. I don't know if that's a two layer board or a 16 layer board. Like you have to let me know the complexity of what you are working with. So those are things that I try to do and I still continue to do, um, especially now that I have that experience of actually hiring a student. I'm able to know not only how to help the women and minorities really sell themselves. Um, but also I've been able to learn from my coworkers. How is it that with their eyes of, you know, non-female, non-minority, how are they looking at this person? What, what is it that is going through their head when they're looking at this extremely modest resume? So those are all things that I am disclosing to um, my followers, letting everybody know and helping as much as I can. And, you know, it is a lot of work and it is a lot of work outside of the work that I already do with my regular job, but I'm really passionate about it. So, yeah, it's, it's very important to me that I am very transparent about what goes on when we are looking to hire somebody. Yeah, so those are all great points. You guys are very impressive with all the things that you guys have been trying to do for. Um, making things more diverse and making things more inclusive. Um, one of the top things that I have found is asking people for statistics that they aren't proud of is a very good way to get it, at least in their head. Um, 
So when I was on a leadership board um, in uh, Arrow, when you are uh, in charge of a club, you get to meet with the um, department head once a month. And uh, when I was in one of those leadership positions, I was able to ask questions about the diversity. I was able to ask questions about how what's our percentage of women and then asking what percentage of women are in the clubs, uh, which clubs are the ones with uh, the most women in them? Why is that? Um, so asking people who don't necessarily, who aren't proud of their numbers, what they are, is a really good way to bring up uh, that topic. Now, one, one thing that's always struck me specifically about Purdue, um, there is a huge amount of diversity as far as like global. We have a lot of international students, which is something I'm very happy that I got to experience at Purdue, um, learning how different cultures work, le uh, learning how to work with people from different cultures, because honestly, everything is global now. Um, but one thing that in particular, the aerospace program is bad at is, I've been, for lack of a better word, I don't know what else to call it, but there's not much domestic diversity in the aerospace program. Even in the graduate department, it's like half the students are international students, which is great, fine with that, but then, we have all all of the black students that I have ever met in my department are international students. I have never once met an American black student in my department. And that always struck me as really weird. I and mean, I met one, no, one or two people who were uh, Latinx. That's it. Which strikes me as being like, that should be a huge red flag. Why is that not something that you're worried about? But they're always touting that they're diverse because they have a ton of international students. Um, and so I've brought that up. And I, I know that's not necessarily a comfortable thing to say because having international students is a great thing to have. But you can't rely on that to be your only diversity when all of your students that are American are white. That should be something that should be a red flag. So I've been bringing that up to my department I know it makes them uncomfortable, um, but it's something that they need to address. And it's come up once since then, I've been asked a question from the department like uh, to elaborate on, on it, but it's, it takes somebody to notice, right? So it's, it, should be everybody noticing it, but it does take someone to notice it in order for it to become something that's addressed. If nobody sees that there's a problem, they're not gonna do anything about it. Um, so within that, I've also been, I've worked with the Graduate Women's Gathering. I was one of the ambassadors for that group, which is not quite as active as the uh, Women in Aerospace program at Purdue. Uh, it's more of a way, the main purpose of it is a way for the women graduate students to meet each other because you could go if you didn't have another woman in your uh, research group you could go the whole grad program without actually having to interact with another woman um which is sad so we have a group where we have weekly or monthly tea or coffee meetings breakfasts uh outings where we go do things together to try and build friendships and it's really quite lovely um Mostly we don't branch out to doing networking like for job purposes because there's so many other clubs that already do that. And most of our members always said that what they really want is the social aspect of it. So that's what we provide. Um, but out of that, I realized that if I had known as an undergrad, if I had known a graduate student who could be a mentor to me, that would have been very helpful um, to have somebody to look up to that was a female who was a graduate student would have made me feel much more confident about my decision. Um, so I've been trying to be a mentor to undergrads um, while I've still been in school. I've been trying to encourage uh, the female undergrads, especially with getting the machining or uh, analysis uh, background that they might not otherwise get. Um, and part of that is coming to it from an, an aspect of, I want to learn this, I don't know about it, so help me learn it. And I've tried to give people a nudge in that direction um, because yes, you could show up and not know how to do the machining tasks, you won't get assigned them. Maybe there's a guy who does know it, but 
if you want to learn it, especially if you have an opportunity on a project, just saying, I don't know how to do that, but I want to learn it is a really important step. Most of the guys that I've known or also helped mentor are perfectly happy to teach somebody how to do something. Um, they're very excited about it too. Um, but coming from it, coming to it and saying, I don't know how to do this. I want to learn it usually gets you the first hurdle, the whole idea of you not being smart enough. Well, you're going to be smart enough to learn it. Um, you're already here. So I've been trying to help undergrads to see a path and to understand that they're not alone in this great big academic world. These were all such great advice and messages. I, again, I, I, I literally went through a therapy session. This is so good. Um, just want to ask everyone to smile for three seconds so that we can take a screenshot for our thumbnail. One, two, three. Did you get the screenshot, Shireen? Yes, I got it. Nice. Okay. Uh, now I'm going to share this last slide I want to show everyone. If Shireen could pull it up. Well, well, yes, so uh, sorry, uh, not yet. Okay. There you go. So, yeah, as an undergrad student who uh, haven't done as crazy, uh, impressive things like all these panelists have done, I am part of the WOA trying to make small changes I can make. And WOA is always accepting more students, young professionals or um, industry people to get involved in, um, you know, like broaden our network and help out more undergraduate students and other women in aerospace and need the resource and support they very much deserve. So if any of you are interested in volunteering or um, helping helping us organize more events and everything, here are the emails. So definitely email us. Uh, we also have LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, well official. So yeah, just reach out to us through any way, and we we are always, always looking for volunteers. So, yeah, please reach out. Thank you so much for all the panelists and all the attendees for coming and making this amazing panel happen. I learned so much from this, and I am leaving this panel with, I don't know, such a jolly and refreshed soul. It has been a great panel, and I hope all of you had the same experience as well. Thank you for coming. Thank you for.